Hey guys, thanks for joining me this evening. I see a bunch of people already in the chat room. Thanks so much for coming along for the journey. Again, we're going to continue our series down memory lane with my archive series that I'm doing here. Um, uploading videos and presentations and things that I did going back 10 years ago now, in this case, nine years ago. Um, uh, last night I gave the first presentation I ever uh, did for a live big public audience. I mean, I had done a recording of that Mythology and the Coming Great Deception video f in front of some friends and family, but uh, the what you saw last night was the first time being in the public scene in a big conference with 700 people. Uh, so it was my first time doing something like that. And uh, this evening we're going to do the, uh, I'm going to air the second presentation that I did at the Future Congress in 2011. And this is going to be the Mount Hermon Roswell connection. Of course, all of this is the nonfiction foundation upon which the science fiction of Seed is based. Um, you also noticed that uh, last night, let me switch over to my YouTube channel here. Uh, last night, you'll notice that I uploaded uh, an interview that Derek Gilbert did with me the same day. It was actually later in the evening, the same day that I did the uh, Mythology and the Coming Great Deception presentation. Later that evening, much later that evening, uh, I was part of a panel discussion that included uh, Jeff Patty and Russ Dizdar, again hosted by Derek Gilbert, talking about contending with the supernatural. That was fun. Uh, that went well into the evening. I <laughs> uh, was quite tired the next morning. First thing in the morning, I am not a morning person. First thing in the morning, I had to do the uh, Mount Hermon Roswell Connection presentation. Really enjoyed it, though. I had a really good audience uh, for that. Um, I was in a breakout room. Uh, I wasn't on the main stage for these, but I was in a breakout room. But still, uh, there had to be close to 100 people crammed into that room. And it was standing room only. There were people out in the hallway leaning in, watching the presentation. So had some really good representation there. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, last night, when I aired the mythology presentation, uh, some people who c weren't here to watch it live tried to watch it. You know, after it went, you know, after it was posted to the YouTube, and it said it was blocked in your country, and the reason for that was that I had some clips at the beginning. Those who watched it live saw I had some clips from the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, and they flagged it. It's got a two-hour video, and they flagged two minutes, <laughs> two minutes out of a two-hour video, and they blocked it in like 200 countries or something crazy like that. So um, fortunately, they had an option. Uh, in YouTube for it said you can trim that section out so I was like ah okay so I trimmed it out and uh, so if you weren't able to watch it last night you should be able to today at least in theory it, it's showing it's all green and no restrictions on it today so if you missed it last night the only thing you're going to miss out on is the History Channel Ancient Aliens thing which isn't that big a deal it's more of a setup just trying to set the stage for what the presentation was going to be about. This presentation also has uh, about a two-minute clip from Ancient Aliens, but what I'm going to try to do is maybe cheat it a little bit. Um, I listen to everything at double speed. <laughs> when I'm editing, when I'm watching YouTube, like I've just gotten used to it. I, I, everything I do these days online, if, if the option to double speed is available, that's what I'm doing. So I'm like almost always in chip, chipmunk mode. Um, so for those of you who are not used to it, it may be kind of hard for you to maybe uh, follow along, but hopefully we'll be able to get away with it. Um, if not, then I'll just do the trim thing again and cut that out. But uh, I'm playing the video off of my computer uh, for you um, this evening uh, through uh, Premiere Pro. So uh, I'm going to try to cheat it by uh, hitting uh, the, the double speed. Uh, during that part. So uh, the uh, clip from Ancient Aliens is talking about ancient breeders. And of course, my presentation is giving an alternative view uh, to that. In fact, uh, it was about a year or two later that uh, I did a conference in New Jersey. And I, don't, I don't know if I have that one actually on video anywhere. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. But I was invited by Dave Stinnett to speak at the, I think it was like the 51st or 54th or something like that annual UFO conference in New Jersey, and uh, it was the all, it was the ancient aliens crowd. Uh, uh, Giorgio with the big hair guy, he wasn't there, but quite a number of other people from the from ancient aliens were there, uh, and they were actually really cool. Nick Redfern was there. Um, 
uh, Dr. Robert Schock was there. Uh, I can't think of the other guy. Uh, uh, Richard Dolan, I think it was his name, uh, was there. Several others. Um, and th- they quote from the Bible all the time. They're like, you know, ancient Hebrew scriptures say, and then, of course, they spin it, you know, and, and say it's, it's really talking about ancient aliens. Um, and so I, I kind of pulled a fast one on them. I, I, I showed a clip from ancient aliens and where it says you know, millions of people around the world believe uh, that in ancient aliens or that the earth has been visited by aliens or, or whatever. And I, I changed it to millions of people around the earth believe in the Hebrew Bible. And the normal narrative is what if million, uh, millions of people around the world believe we've been visited by extraterrestrials? What if it were true? And I changed it to millions of people around the world believe in the Hebrew Bible. What if it were true? <laughs> so I kind of pulled a fast one on them. And I say, hey, listen, guys, you know, you guys use my book all the time, my book meaning the Bible. Um, would you mind if I did it, this, if I used it too? Um, I want to share with you, you know, sort of my take on what's going on from a biblical worldview. And they were, like, incredibly receptive, actually. Had some really cool conversations with many of these guys, um, both during the conference as well as off-site. You know, we, we got to hang out and have dinner and stuff together. So, you know, they were really receptive to it. But the presentation I'm going to give tonight was the setup for all of that. And of course, all of this, again, is the uh, nonfiction behind the science fiction uh, of Seed, Seed the Series. So if you want to learn more about Seed and why I'm doing this, uh, you can go to seedtheseries.com. This is the main page. You can scroll down. Uh, there's like, um, uh, this is a PDF right here, Seed Development. It's like a 27-page PDF that really describes why I'm doing this project, what the plan is. This is uh, at least an early draft of the uh, pilot episode. It's a three-part pilot. This is episode one uh, right here, so you could kind of get a feel for where we're going. I have since updated it, uh, not here on the website, but I've updated the script a bit. You know, they say it's nothing in the film industry, nothing's ever written, it's always rewritten. <laughs> That's true, right? Like, even to the point where you're, you're rewriting on the set. So, uh, this by no means is a final script. It's, 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 it's a, a good first draft, first, second, or third draft, actually. Um, this is uh, this link right here will take you to the audio drama that Rick Hummer and I did back in 2014 with several other uh, local as well as actors from out of state. Uh, that was fun. We'd actually we're actually thinking about restarting that uh, in all my spare time. <laughs> um, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, I would like to do it again. That was a lot of fun. And you know, at least until we're funded to do the TV series why not, right? We can certainly do that, but it does take a significant investment in time. Uh, not a lot of money. It's, it's fairly inexpensive to produce. Um, I would like to pay my actors. The last time I couldn't pay my, back, my actors, I didn't have the money to do it, uh, but I'd like to be able to do that um, th- uh, this time around. Um, speaking of actors, uh, while I have your attention, uh, if you are a male and you happen to speak Japanese fluently, I need you. So, Or if you know somebody, who is a male who speaks Japanese fluently, please uh, send them to me. Uh, You could uh, uh, write to me at um, rob at seedtheseries.com, rob at seedtheseries.com. Please, if I'm only soliciting that right now, please don't use that email for for general inquiry or anything like that uh, because I already have more emails than I can possibly handle at the moment. Um, But uh, to finish the project that we're working on right now in South Africa, I actually need the voice of a Japanese. I have three Japanese characters, but you know, perhaps one person that can alter their voice a little bit can do all three parts. Or if there are three actors out there, great, <laughs> you know, all all the all the better. Um, but I do need that, and I need that pretty quick. So if you fit that description, or if you know somebody who does, please put uh, put them in contact with me at rob at seedtheseries dot com. Looking for male Japanese actors who can speak Japanese fluently. Um, you could get on our email list. Uh, I haven't really sent anything out, so if you're already on the list and you're wondering why you haven't gotten any emails, that's because I haven't sent any. Um, Seed Vlogs, uh, that's uh, videos of the journey, just me giving updates and stuff like that. And um, the Seed Research uh, page, I'll talk about this a little bit more probably at the um, at the end of the broadcast. Uh, but uh, a lot of stuff that you're going to hear tonight um, is also available in print and DVD format on the Seed Store page. So you can go to um, 
it, you either get to it on the front page like I just did or click in the top right link uh, and, and these are the DVDs and stuff. So tonight uh, I'll be doing the Mount Hermon Roswell connection. Let me go back to the main page. <clears throat> uh, and then if you scroll down, um, why uh, becoming culturally relevant using media, that's the presentation that I did back in 2010. Uh, and these are the th four different projects that we're working on, the TV series, the video games. A lot of good progress on the video games right now. Um, some interesting uh, developments have happened. You know, I've already spent about $20,000 on this over the last, uh, you know, five or six years, I guess. Um, it's going to cost a whole lot more than that, though, to finish it. But uh, I've got some good progress going on with that. We're trying to do it in virtual reality. Um, it's a story about uh, Noah and his three sons and how they have to get the bones of Adam onto the ark before the flood comes and deal with Nephilim and everything along the way. It's a quite an adventurous game. Uh, we're real excited about that. The fiction novel is sort of on hold right now just because I've been doing a lot of rewrites on the TV scripts as well as the comic book. Um, and I, before I release the novel, I want to make sure it's really polished. Uh, I had a guy, Christopher Whitestone, uh, who uh, helped me write this. Um, he, he took the scripts and started turning them into a fictional novel. Uh, did a really good job with it, but uh, it still needs some work, so that's temporarily on hold. Uh, the comic book, uh, we had these done, uh, and they came out really good. I'm, like, really happy with... Let me see if you can see... Uh, the quality of it was uh, was very well done. Um, let's see if we get there. We go. Anyway, a lot of good stuff uh, in here. Um, I got some guys from uh, Spain and uh, Argentina uh, help. No, not, not Argentina. Is it Argentina? Yeah, I think it's Argentina. Uh, helping me with this project right now. Uh, uh, we are working on episode two, issue number two. This is the limited collector's edition right here, which we sold out of. Um, I'm going to be ordering another set that's not the collector's editions. It's just the regular edition. Uh, so the only difference would be it doesn't have the certificate in the back. It'll have a different page here. Uh, we only made 500 of these. Um, that should I should be able to order those pretty soon, so stay tuned for that, uh, and those will be uh, less expensive. So stay tuned for that. Um, these are the goals and stuff. Um, some of these need to be updated, it looks like. Uh, look, guys, this is an expensive endeavor. Um, but the way you need to think of it is the same way that the secular world thinks about what they're doing. They realize, you know, $1 equals one person. So when they make a movie for $100 million or more, they're realizing that they're reaching over 100 million people with whatever message they're putting out there. That's why they've been so effective at what they do. Um, they're not afla afraid to invest in people. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to invest, in this case, in the kingdom and getting messages out like what you're about to hear tonight to the masses. I mean, last night's video, let's see. Uh, let me update this and just get a feel for... Okay, so, wow. All right, 10,000 views. So... The mythology coming great deception has had 10,000 views since last night. That's pretty awesome. Uh, it'll probably my guess will be it'll cap out mm, under probably under 100,000. I'd be surprised if it goes over that. Uh, most of the videos that uh, for whatever reason because I'm shadow banned and whatnot r rarely get over 15,000. Uh, the fact that this got 10,000 in a day uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so it may get out to more, but we're not reaching the 7.5 billion people out there. And let me tell you, having traveled the world, um, George Lucas has reached those people. I've been in the deepest, darkest jungles with people living on in grass huts on stilts, and you could ask them through translation, "What does the where does the phrase "May the force be with you" come from?" And they all know it. <laughs> you know, uh, all over the world. They know Star Wars. They know Star Trek. They know the, the Avengers. They know the superhero movies. You know, uh, the world has been enormously effective at reaching billions of people. So, you know, again, people wonder, wh why am I doing this? Well, in I don't know how much time we have left. You'll, you'll hear in this presentation that I'm about to play this evening uh, a sense of urgency. And, and because that was at that time, that was uh, July of 2011. Uh, and, of course... 
I still believe most of the things I was talking about there, but obviously I've learned a lot since then. You know, four years later, I got introduced to biblical cosmology. So, you know, you're going to hear me talking about planet and stuff like that in this um, presentation, uh, you know. Uh, but four years later, I'm going, okay, well, wait a minute, i got to rethink all that. Um, you know, so there's some evolution that takes place, you know, here. But there was a, a sense of urgency because at this time we were a, a year away from 2012 and everybody was talking about December 21st, 2012 is what's going to happen. You know, the Aztec calendar stone, the Mayans, all that stuff. It's like, you know, um, people were speculating, you know, is, are the aliens or the Anunnaki going to return? Are we going to have some kind of major planetary worldwide, you know, shift, you know, uh, the planet's going to, um, uh, have a pole sh shift or something. The cosmic alignments or, you know, the aliens going to come back, all kinds of stuff. People were speculating, wondering what's going to happen. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember back then, but after the December 21st, 2010 blood red lunar eclipse that floated over the shoulders of Orion, like a decapitated head, which I talked about in the last presentation, right after that, we had all kinds of, uh, you know, millions of fish beaching themselves, breed specific too, like the same breed of, of fish beaching themselves dead. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of birds, breed specific, falling out of the sky, dead. Earthquakes happening all over the place. I showed you that clip in that video where uh, I think it was Dutch Sense was showing the the internet seismic servers that check earthquake activity around the world. Where they were all going in the black as Nimrod's hometown was announcing, "Hey, we're back in business again." You know, Babylon was you know rising. Um, so a lot of things were happening right after that. Blood Red Lunar Eclipse, December 21st, 2010, which I believe was the actual date that the the ancients were pointing to. And I believe our calendars are off by two years because if you look at the Revelation 12 sign of the birth of Yeshua, that event happened on 9-11, September 11th on the Gregorian calendar, if you go back in time using Stellarium. That happened on the Gregorian calendar, September 11th, uh, 3 BC, which is reckoned as negative two. So negative two uh, from the current time is, you know, it's two years off. That that would that marks the birth of, of Christ. So since our current calendar is AD, uh, marked from the birth of Christ, then our calendar is off by two years. We're two years ahead. So I contend that the the big sign and everything that everybody was in the ancient world was seeing that something was significant was going to happen, actually did happen. But it happened on December twenty first, two thousand ten, which is why. It, more or less went under the radar because if all the things that occurred on 2000, uh, December 21st, 2010 and the days and weeks following would have happened on December 21st, 2012, you got to know everybody and their dog would have been talking about it, you know, but December 21st, 2012 was for all intents and purposes a dud, you know, nothing really happened. So, um, yeah, I think, I think what really happened was two years prior. So, but at the time, we didn't know that. This is looking back in in retrospect now. So, giving the presentation, you know, there's a sense of urgency because we don't. We were looking at December 20, uh, 2012 and wondering, is this it? You know, or are, are we in the last days? Now, here we are nine years later, and we're going, what's going to happen? Is this the end times? You know, is the beast rising? Are we looking at the mark of the beast with the vaccines? And, you know, we, almost all the questions people are asking today, we were asking back then in in 2011. You know, there, there was a sense that something's happening. You know, is this year going to be any different? I don't know. You know, it, we, we may have more time. Or we may not. All I know is we're supposed to occupy until he comes. What does that look like? Well, whatever he's called you, whatever Yahuwah has called you to do, that's what you're supposed to do. I've been called to do this, seed. So um, I'm occupying until he comes. You know, if he happens to come back quick and I never get to make one episode, at least I tried. You know, I, I will hopefully be found worthy of hearing well done because I was doing what I believe I was told to do. Um, if we have more time... Uh, then we may actually make this happen. And I believe it's important that we do make it happen. Um, not that we make it happen, but uh, that we yield ourselves to let him make it happen. But you know what? He does it through us. He's not going to just pop out a TV series magically on Netflix, <laughs> just out of thin air. It takes people to make it happen. And so, you know, my whole goal is to take all the research that I've done. I'm sharing quite a bit of it with you guys, you know, now showing you what I've been doing for the last 10 years, trying to go back in time and sequentially release these things so you guys can sort of see the journey that led us here. Uh, but realize the real goal 
is not to reach a few thousand people on YouTube or on a radio show or on blogs, or, you know, or books or DVDs. It's to reach the masses. And I'm convinced the only way to reach the masses is to put it in a format that the world will actually want to go see. And so, again, that's the, the reason and purpose behind Seed. Now, the um, the content uh, of, of all the stuff that's in the books and DVDs and everything I have, uh, our website's BabylonRisingBooks.com. You can click on the store tab, and there's all kinds of special package deals and DVDs and books and timelines. Some people were asking about the timelines that they saw last night. Um, in the presentation, you can get the digital versions of those in PDF format and actually in 300 DPI uh, formats as well that you could take to a uh, like a Staples or an Office Max or something like that, uh, hand it off to them on a thumb drive or whatever, and they can print them out for you. And they'll be it's a good three foot, uh, three foot long um, timeline chart. So if you're interested in that, you can check all that out. And um, all of this content, though, is available for free. If you click on the blog site, that takes you over here to the Babylon Rising blog. And uh, all the stuff like, like right here, book one, the first shall be last, this is the content that in blog format that ended up being my first book, Babylon Rising. These links right here uh, ended up being the content for my second book, uh, Archon Invasion. The, the uh, Book three right here, this content right here, was pretty much what you saw last night in the mythology and the coming great deception hasn't made it into book format yet um in the last days one this is probably going to be a while um if we have a while before i put that out in book because right now my thoughts on end times and how they play out has radically shifted since i wrote this stuff back in 2010 and 11 lots of different viewpoints i do reference uh something though in this evening's broadcast and that is the seven year tribulation and if you click on that page uh, it shows this timeline chart right here uh, that you can just right click and save if you're interested. I haven't really looked at it too much in depth since then, um, but just looking at it real quick here, I would say I still pretty much agree with it. I don't think my views have changed too much on it, but it, this is a timeline chart that actually takes into account the Nephilim which you rarely ever hear when, unless you're in sort of the Tom Horn crowd, you're, you know, Skywatch TV and Prophecy and the News and all that. You really don't hear people talking about end times incorporating the whole idea of the Nephilim and stuff into it. So uh, that's the first of its kind that I'm aware of, a timeline chart that actually does that. So uh, I do reference that in this evening's uh, presentation. So that's the link you can check out for yourself. Uh, going to, uh, again, BabylonRisingBlog.com. Scroll down to the bottom where it says seven-year tribulation period. Okay, so uh, let me switch over here and get ready to uh, let me make sure my hard drives are all spun up again. Sometimes they decide to go to sleep when I'm not using them. And um, we should be able to get the presentation started. And again, I'm going to try to... Um, double speed the uh, History Channel stuff so I don't get flagged in. All right, so I think it's all set to go. Here we go. Stand by. The purpose of this presentation is to examine mythology and the gods of the ancient world from a biblical perspective. All images, video, and audio clips contained in this video are presented for critical examination and educational purposes only. Do powerful gods and goddesses actually exist? And if so, where do they come from? When you look at many of the mythologies around the world, they have these stories of gods coming down from the sky. There's a beautiful description of the way that the gods move, like when they kind of come down to the earth, you get the sense of them gliding down, but the way that they move is kind of beyond time. It just kind of happens. If the ancient Greeks invented the stories of gods as a primitive attempt to explain their universe, how can we account for similar deities found in widely different regions and cultures around the globe? Was it mere coincidence, or was there a common origin for these gods who supposedly traveled to earth from the skies? session today is called the Mount Hermon Roswell Connection. And in order to kind of set the stage for this discussion, it's important that we get at least a kind of foundation uh, on fallen angels. Just a little bit of a foundational uh, starting point here with 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, that's the enemy that we're fighting. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, I was in the Army. I was in the first of the 110th Air Cav. And I uh, started out, went through infantry basic training, and then went from there to become a helicopter mechanic and was a door gunner, uh, and then became a helicopter pilot in 1989 and flew for the rest of the time that I was there as a helicopter pilot. And when anybody joins the military, uh, they'll go through some form of basic training. In the Army, we had a book called the Common Soldier's Task Book. And with that book, we had to get that, that was like our Bible at boot camp. <laughs> uh, with that book, we had to, they had to teach us what our chain of command is so we knew who we were taking our mar marching orders from, you know, who do we answer to. Um, and that's important, you know, so you're not getting conflicting orders from different people. You know who you take orders from and who you don't. So you got to know who your, who's your chain of command, who do you answer to. We all had common tasks that every soldier had to perform. We had to know whatever your equipment was that you're operating. They used to say, you know, you have to be smarter than the equipment you're operating. <laughs> so, you know, if you're working on trucks, you got to be smarter than a truck, you know. Uh, and in my case, it was helicopters, so we had to be smarter than the equipment we're operating. I had to learn helicopters inside and out, uh, how, how they work and whatnot. Uh, and we have to know our weapons, whatever our assigned weapons are. We have to be able to take it apart, clean it with our eyes closed and all that, and timed and, and all that kind of stuff, know our weapons inside and out. And, of course, we have to know our military tactics. We have to know how our, our military functions uh, in combat. After we get essentially the basics of how we operate, we spend the rest of our time getting to know our enemy learning all about threat identification, as I said, threat ID. And we used to do things like this. We used to have uh, flashcards. Anybody have prior service experience or anybody in service? Can anybody tell me besides the tank what that is? <laughs> what the nomenclature is? T-72, somebody's got it. There you go. That is a, yes, sir, T-72 Russian tank. Didn't know you are going to be quizzed this morning, did you? Uh, what about this one here? Yeah, there you go. Hein D, uh, MI-24 Hein D. Close, I'll let that one go. There's not much of a difference there. Uh, so we had to know it by, by uh, line drawing, by silhouettes. We had to know it uh, by photograph. We had to be able to readily identify our enemy so that in combat we could know the difference between that and that. Good guy, bad guy. <laughs> Now, obviously, if they're shooting at you, that's a pretty good indication of which one's which, <laughs> right? But you can see how similar they look. You know, that's a U.S. Apache helicopter, and that's a Russian Hind D. I had no idea how much that training would pay off uh, recently. Um, anybody know who Steve Quayle is? Anybody know who Steve Quayle? He puts out a, a newsletter every now and then, uh, kind of keeping people up to date on what's going on in the world. And, you know, I already kind of one of those tinfoil hat wearing guys, you know, <laughs> uh, somewhat conspiracy minded just to begin with. And he put something out, I think it was in October, November, somewhere around there, uh, saying that th it looked like we could be uh, heading for a bank holiday, that the banks could shut down. You're not going to be able to get your money and, you know, it's not going to be a good thing. And so, and uh, Mr. Griffin talked about it the other night too, as well. You know, putting putting your money into hard assets like gold and silver and whatnot. And so I was I was looking at uh, at the world market, and looking at the news, and looking at Steve Quayle's newsletter, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't have a whole lot of money in the bank anyway. But I had an HSA account that I wasn't really doing anything with, had about three thousand dollars in it. So I thought I'm going to liquidate that and pull it out and put it in silver. So. I, you, you got to put yourself in my brain, okay? <laughs> I, here I am, conspiracy-minded guy, get this thing, there's going to be a bank holiday, everything's going to be horrible, riots in the streets and all that, so I'm going to take my money out and put it in silver. So I get my money out of the bank, and I walk out of Chase Bank, and I look up, and this is flying right at me. I'm like, oh my God, it's a Russian high and D flying over Plano, Texas. And I was on the phone with a buddy of mine who is a former airborne guy, and he's like, no way. I'm like, yeah. And it was coming in for a landing, coming in real low. And so I'm freaking out. I'm already thinking Red Dawn. How many of you saw Red Dawn right, back in the 80s? Right? Uh, for those of you who didn't see it, it was a Russian invasion, right? Uh, and, you know, Patrick Swayze is in it. And, there, and, and the movie opens up with these high school kids sitting in the classroom, and all these Russian paratroopers are landing in the football field. And the teacher walks outside and says, hey, what happened? You guys blow off course or something? The guy takes his AK-47 and blows him away and starts shooting up everybody in. 
uh, Patrick Swayze and, and some of the other uh, high school kids form a resistance uh, a movement called the Wolverines. So I'm beginning to go into Wolverine mode. Uh, and so I see that, that the thing went to go land somewhere, so I'm looking for it, and I get in my car, I'm going to figure out where this thing went. And so I drove around a little bit to, to try to get to that area, and I'm at a red light, and I, and I look up, and I see a second one coming. I, this is it. The balloon's going up. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, and so and, uh, this is a picture of it, if I can get this thing to work right here. Yeah, this is it flying over the, the street there. Uh, it's um, on Park Avenue in Plano, Texas. Uh, and uh, everybody is pulling over to the side of the road and pulling out their cell phones and iPhones and whatnot and taking pictures of it, as I did, taking pictures right here. But I'm pulling, there's a gas station right across the street from where this is. And uh, me and a couple other guys are, are kind of looking at each other. We're looking to see how many good old boys might have a shotgun in the back, you know, <laughs> forming our tactics already, you know. And so the helicopter stop starts to wind down, and all these people start walking out to the helicopter. I'm like, didn't you see my God? What's the matter with you people? <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my God, we're about to see a massacre. <laughs> you know, and I'm looking around trying to see where the other helicopter was, because I saw two of them. Well, as the helicopter finally shut down, I saw some civilian guys getting out of it. I'm like, what? And so obviously the situation, I calmed down a bit, you know, and uh, I walked over to the guy, and it turns out that there's a Russian air museum in Lancaster, Texas, uh, and uh, th they have all kinds of Russian equipment, Cold War equipment, and uh, these guys were hungry for a firehouse subway sandwich, and they <laughs> just went out for a joyride and flew out of Lancaster to Plano to go get a sandwich. I said, dude, you almost got wasted, man. Me and the, those guys over there, <laughs> we were turning into the Wolverines, man. You, you were... You were in trouble. Now, we can laugh about that in hindsight, you know, hindsight, hind deep. But, uh, <laughs> didn't even plan that. Um, <laughs> that wasn't in the script. Um, but what that said to me was I was prepared. If that was a real world scenario, if it was in fact a Red Dawn scenario, I was ready, as were just a very few other guys that with me in the, in the gas station. These people were all dead, if it was a Red Dawn scenario. Yeah, you got your money in and I, yeah, I had my money, but it wasn't in silver yet. <laughs> I didn't get that far. Uh, uh, but I think it's important when we're talking about the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness that we're up against, because... It says in 2 Corinthians, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. I think the devil spends more time appearing as the angel of light than he does the fire-breathing dragon, you know, and the Ozzy Osbourne type stuff, you know, biting off bat heads and stuff. That, this, that we've got to get to know, you know, Jesus said, well, you know them by their fruits, right? We've got to get to know our, our enemies so that we know what we're up against, what we're fighting against. Um, and, of course, our source for doing that is the Bible. But I submit that there are other books as well. And the Bible itself, believe it or not, mentions a whole bunch of books that are not in the Bible. And I've always found that really interesting because... If you believe, as I do, that the Bible is divinely inspired, then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God told the authors of the books of the Bible to reference a lot of these other books. In many cases, the other books are referenced in a way that seems to lend credibility to whatever it is that they are writing. And in the scriptures, we find numerous places where it says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you can establish whether a thing is true or not. So when you find the Bible mentioning other books two or three times, you know, I'm going to go ahead and take that scripture for what it says. The, the scripture seems to be endorsing, if you will, some of these other texts, whether or not they're considered scripture. Two books in particular that I've become really fond of lately is the book of Joshua and the book of Enoch. Now, you guys have probably heard a lot about Enoch over the course of the weekend, but not a lot of people talk about Joshua. Uh, and I'm just going to talk briefly about these two books. Joshua is not a name. It's a, it's a word that means the true and upright or just account. Uh, the name refers to the fact that the records, facts, and history are upright, correct, and thus trustworthy. It is referenced twice by name in the Bible in Joshua and 2 Samuel. What I find really interesting about the Joshua text is, how many of you remember the story in Sunday school of Joshua commanding the sun to stand still to win the battle? What's interesting about that text is it's, it's, that's, in a way, it's not really scripture because the scripture says, is it not written in Joshua that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still? 
So it's almost like under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Here's this pretty wild story, because if you think about it, the sun stood still. That means the earth stopped rotating, <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. And so that's a pretty extraordinary story. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's like God said, hey, why don't you reference that book over there? Because everybody knows that book's true when you're telling this pretty wild story. Now, the book of Joshua follows the Torah. It's the, the next book after the five books of Moses, right? So that tells me that it was written either the same time the Torah was written during the Exodus or sometime prior to it for it to have been a complete work for them to say, hey, remember that book over there? Look over there. So it says to me that Joshua was familiar with it or whoever wrote the book of Joshua and his audience had to have been familiar with it too. Otherwise, what's the sense of referencing it? Nobody knows what it is, right? So that had to have preexisted. Um, in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul makes a reference to two characters by the name of Janus and Jambres as the two people who opposed Moses uh, in Pharaoh's court, you know, throwing down the, the staff and all that. Well, uh, where did he get those names? There's n those names don't appear anywhere in the canon of Scripture that we call canon, the, the 66 books. He got it because he was a learned scribe, studied under G Gamaliel, uh, was very much familiar with the ancient Hebrew text, and so he was referencing the book of Joshua because that's where you find those two characters' names. Uh, I don't believe that it was ever considered to be Scripture by anybody. I believe that the book of Joshua was referred to by the Jews the same way just about every theologian I've ever met refers to the works of Josephus. And everybody agrees that's not scripture, but yet every pastor you've ever heard, an evangelist and, and, and scholar, at some point references the antiquity of the Jews or some of the works of Josephus. So it appears to me that they use the book of Joshua much the same way we use the works of Josephus. Now, the book of Enoch, on the other hand, uh, has been considered scripture, in it. it's been in and out of canon. In fact, it's still in the Ethiopian Coptic Bible as canon. The early church fathers referred to it as canon. Jesus quotes from it. Peter quotes from it. Jude copied and pasted paragraphs and put it in his little short kind of freaky book anyway. Uh, right? So, uh, at least 100 references in the New Testament find precedence nowhere else except the book of Enoch. It, again, it's quoted by Jesus, Peter, and Jude, and others. Widely known and read in the first century. It was viewed as scripture by early church fathers. It's still in the Ethiopian Coptic Bible, and it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you heard my talk yesterday, the timing of when that was found is awfully interesting, uh, because the very beginning, Enoch chapter 1, starts off with, The words of the blessing of Enoch, with which he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living when? In the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are t to be removed. And he began his story saying, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in heaven, which the angels showed me, and I heard everything from them, and I saw and understood. But it was not for this generation, but for a remote future one which is to come. So the book itself says, it's not for this time, it's for later. And in yesterday's talk, I talked about the uh, War of the Worlds and the effect that that had on people when, when Orson Welles did that radio show in 1938. People flipped out. And it was between that time, 1938 and, and 1948, where a whole lot of interesting things happened that we're going to talk more about today, uh, like, Mount, uh, like Roswell, <laughs> uh, for one thing, with Israel becoming a nation as well. So it's awfully interesting, if you look at the timing of events, that the Book of Enoch should pop out of the Dead Sea Scrolls when it did. The reason I like these three books, of course, the scriptures, the Bible, uh, but when you take the Bible and combine it with the books of Joshua and Enoch, a very interesting and detailed story uh, unfolds regarding the fallen angels, who they were and what they did. Just looking at scripture itself, the, just looking at the canon of scripture, the 66 books, you know, we, how many uh, angels fell with Lucifer, right? One third, we know that. 33.33%, remember that number, 33.33%. But how much do we really know about that one-third of the fallen angels? You know, we, we know Lucifer is their leader, but we don't really know a whole lot more than that. You may maybe get some vague references like the Prince of Persia that, you know, Michael and, you know, all that. Uh, but we don't get a whole lot of details about uh, the fallen angels in the 66 books. Uh, of course, Lucifer being their leader, uh, the woman said to the serpent, Lucifer being the serpent, uh, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl in your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring. Whose offspring? The devil's offspring. The serpent's offspring. 
Interesting. And hers, first prophecy in the Bible, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. How many of you know getting your head crushed would be kind of bad? <laughs> so what do you think the devil did? If the devil's fir the first prophecy given is that her seed is going to crush your head, what do you think he's going to do to her seed? He's going to try to mess with the seed, isn't he? So he de doesn't get his head crushed, right? So the first thing he does is he gets two brothers to get into a fight and one to kill the other one. They only have two children, Cain and Abel, and C Cain killed his brother. Now, obviously, if you're looking at that text, it seems that Cain was predisposed to listening to the voice of the enemy, and Abel was predisposed to listening to the voice of God and being obedient. And so the devil got the one that he could get to listen to him to kill the good one, right? So how many of you know that if you lose a child, especially to a traumatic event such as that, that if you have another child, you're going to become extremely protective over your next child, probably even overly protective? So I don't believe the devil was really able to get to Seth uh, too well, not like he did to Cain anyway. And so he turned the page to chapter 6 of Genesis, and you got plan B, <laughs> I think, where the, the uh, sons of God, which is Benai Elohim, if I'm pronouncing that right in Hebrew, uh, I really get frustrated by seminaries and pastors and people who teach the Sethite theory that the sons of God are the sons of Seth and the daughters of men are the daughters of Cain. That's ridiculous. The same Hebrew phrase is used in the book of Job referencing the angels and how Lucifer appears before God and, you know, and all that. And so they can accept that that phrase, the Benah Elohim, is angels in Job, and yet they deny it in Genesis. That's just, uh, I don't understand that. But anyway, the text says what it says. It's the angels come down, and they mated with the daughters of men, and they created a creature called the Nephilim, angel-human hybrids. And as we learned yesterday in, in the teaching I did yesterday, uh, they were the heroes of old men of renown. Now, Nephilim, it, if you think of the Bible, okay, th if that's all there is, it, the Bible, uh, here you got the Torah, you're six chapters into the first book of the Bible, and he's mentioning a word, uh, wh Nephilim, who's that? What's that? Again, it presupposes that, that Moses, and of course he talked directly with God, but, that, uh, but it means the audience that he was writing, also, when he wrote Nephilim, everybody said, yeah, okay, we know what that is. Well, how did they know? There had to have been something, other text or something, for them to know what the Nephilim were in chapter 6 of the first book, right? Uh, again, hint, they were not uh, the children of Cain and Seth's offering. So Moses seemed to have access to other information, and so did the people who listened to him and read his writings. Now, is there any proof of Nephilim on the planet? I believe there's lots of proof, actually. Uh, I start doing some research on the... Conehead skulls there from Peru, I believe. Uh, that's really interesting research. Some of you may have seen pictures like this circulating around the Internet. A lot of people say it's a fraud. They say it's Photoshop. I am a Photoshop expert, so I could create stuff like that. I know how that can be done pretty easily and, be, and very convincing. But I submit maybe they're not all frauds. Because these days, uh, especially if you, Steve Quayle's got a really big book on giants, it's pretty amazing, uh, documentation of, of all the finds of giants, uh, skeletons and whatnot throughout history. Uh, but recently, in the last hundred years or so, uh, people like the U.S. government and the Smithsonian and even the Vatican tend to get involved as soon as a giant bone <laughs> is found, shut down the, the, the site and uh, get rid of the evidence and discredit the guys who found it. Uh, that seems to be a motive th these days. Uh, but uh, at the Mount, uh, Mount Blanco Fossil Museum, look at that femur bone right there <laughs> compared to this guy. He's probably close to six feet tall. You know, he's standing next to uh, a very big guy. <laughs> uh, and there's a jawbone, of course, compared to a cast of a, a normal person. And uh, you may have seen this kind of circulating around the Internet as well. This, this shows some of the various uh, skeletons that have been found throughout history and the dates and whatnot. You notice this 36-footer here was apparently found in 650 B.C., 640 A.D., somewhere in that time frame uh, that has been found uh, in the dirt. So there is evidence that giants indeed walked this earth. Now, when we look at the book of Enoch, regarding the, there's, the book of Enoch talks about 200 fallen angels, a class of angel called the Watchers. Now, we, we know that there are different classes. There are cherubim, seraphim, you know, archangels. There are all these different classes of angels. One of the classes of angels that's actually mentioned in the book of Daniel is a Watcher. 
And the book of Enoch records that there were 200 watcher class angels that landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. Uh, I think it was Noah's great great granddaddy, uh, if I remember right. And the text names 20 of those 200 as sort of the captains, the leaders over those 200, with Sam Jaza being the the, the leader of all of them. There's one name up here that, that is not up here, I should say, uh, in this list. It appears later in the text, and that's Azazel. And that was mentioned, I think, by Gary Stearman or, or somebody uh, this weekend mentioned Azazel. And that is mentioned in your scriptures. Uh, Leviticus 16, if I remember right, it's the scapegoat, where they would uh, cast lots and either for the Lord or for Azazel. What's interesting about the text is it says that, that the fallen angels are allowed to do what they did for a certain amount of time. And then finally, the narrative takes you up into heaven. And we know from the canon of scripture that we have uh, Michael and Gabriel archangels. But a lot of these other texts reference two other guys, Uriel and Raphael. And so Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, Raphael are looking down and seeing what Sam Jaza and all these other guys are doing. And they're like, Lord, how long are you going to let this happen? Look what they're doing. Look what Azazel is doing. Azazel essentially taught the, the art of pulling the metals out of the earth and creating weapons and, and the art of war. And so God assigns uh, uh, Raphael to bind Azazel in chains in a place called Dudiel out in the desert someplace. And he says something really interesting. He said, ascribe all sin to Azazel. And so that's why, and it's very strong in the Hebrew mindset, uh, actually, this whole concept of Azazel. But they would send the scapegoat out to Azazel. Why? Because all sin had been ascribed to it. We're familiar with the scripture, uh, Isaiah 118, though your sins be as scarlet, they are made white as snow, right? Everybody familiar with that? Well, that's actually related to that whole Azazel story. Because what they would do is they would tie a scarlet ribbon around the horns of the scapegoat, cut a piece of it off, and put it on the temple door, send the scapegoat out to Azazel, and then wait. And then supernaturally, the scarlet red thread would turn white to show that God had accepted the, the, uh, the, s the sacrifice of the offering. What's really interesting is for 40 years leading up to the, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, it never turned white. Back off 40 years from 70 AD, and what do you got? <laughs> what do you get? Jesus, right? God said, this is a sacrifice that I'm going to accept. It's very interesting. Um, but... Google Earth is a, is a fun program to play around with, so I decided to look and check out Mount Hermon to see where it is, and so this is where the 200 fallen angels called Watchers landed on planet Earth. They landed right about here. Mount Hermon is, a, is actually a, uh, a mountain range. It's a, it's a range of mountains, and this is pretty much the, uh, the center of the mountain range that is Mount Hermon. Now keep your eyes kind of in that area right there. Now, maybe this is just my overactive imagination as a filmmaker, <laughs> but I was looking at that, and I was like, wow, it, it kind of, just the outline of the topography there, take it for whatever it is, I was just like, that's pretty interesting. Wow. Yeah, yeah. kind of cool. Uh, so that's where the ancient texts say that the fallen angels landed. Now, uh, this is Mount Hermon today, and have any of you heard of a guy by the name of David Flynn? Yeah. David Flynn. Uh, has done some amazing work, and you can confirm this for yourself on Google Earth. He determined that the location, the center of the M Mount Hermon mountain range is 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian, which was the true Prime Meridian until they changed it for political reasons. Now, Google Earth, you'll see, has 35.54, but if you subtract the difference between Greenwich and Paris, you end up with 33.33. So is that just a coincidence that, that one-third, 33.33 percent of the angels of heaven landed on the only geographical location on the planet that fits their number long before Google Earth came out? <laughs> Very interesting. 33.33 degrees, uh, but he took it a step farther. He measured the, the distance between the, that location and went west and found that it was 2,012 nautical miles. 2,012 is that magic number, right? 2012 nautical miles from that location to the Paris Prime Meridian, and 2012 nautical miles from that location to the equator. <coughs> Again, is that a coincidence? Hmm, I don't think so. I think it's all adding up to something. Yeshua said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, those of you who attended uh, yesterday's talk, remember I had a chart depicting the days of Noah and all kinds of weird and wild and crazy stuff was going on there. Uh, showing that the, the 200 fallen angels participated in what I call the Genesis 6 experiment, 
somewhere around the end of the ninth jubilee. Each of these gray columns represents a 50-year time period. The jubilee, each column is 1,000 years. So they show up right about here. The floods not to way, get way back over here. So between 1,000 and 1,200 years, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, producing all sorts of monstrosities and causing all kinds of damage to the point where God said, my entire creation that I once called very good is now completely corrupt. Completely corrupted in about 1,000 years. Now, the question arises, after the flood, we know that there were giants in the land in those days and also afterwards. Genesis 6, 1 through 4, talks about uh, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and, and created the Nephilim, the great men of renown, right? Now, a lot of people uh, subscribe to what's called a second incursion, that what they did in Genesis chapter 6, they continued to do. I don't believe that that's true, and I'll, I'll give you my reasons for it uh, as we go forward, but basically they take it with the, the, um, the Nephilim, the giants were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards when the sons of God came down to the daughters of men and created giants by them again and again and again and again is the way they would interpret that, that scripture. I submit that another way you can look at that scripture, and I believe the Hebrew lends it to this interpretation as well, is that as a result of what happened in the days of Jared, there were giants in the land in those days and also afterwards. You see what I'm saying? That the first cause was in Genesis 6 that had repercussions that continued afterwards, not that angels continued to mate with humans uh, again and again and again and again. There's several reasons why I believe that, that the second incursion is not true. Uh, the 200 who landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared received an extremely severe punishment from God for what they did. In fact, even before they began, Semjaza said, you know, I have a feeling, I, you know, I know what we're about to do. God's not going to like this very much. And so... Uh, I have a feeling that I'm going to go through with it, but I'm going to turn around and all you guys are going to be back there and you're not going to go through with it as well. And everybody said, no, no, we're in it. We're all together, all for one, right? You know, three musketeers, 200 musketeers. They all put their hands together and they created an oath. And essentially that's what Mount, why Mount Hermon was called Mount Hermon because it was based on the oath that they all took to go through with it. When they did go through with it, their judgment was extremely severe. And we know that from a couple places in Scripture. I chose the Weymouth uh, New Testament uh, version of this passage, 2 Peter 2, 4, for God did not spare the angels when they had sinned. How did Peter know that? But hurling them, them down to Tartarus, your translations probably say hell, consigned them to caves of darkness, keeping them in readiness for judgment. Tartarus is, an, is, is a very significant name, the reason why he, he chose it. Now, you remember, uh, at the time that the New Testament was written, the, they were in a Roman society, a Greek society, and the Greek gods and all that was very well known to everybody. The Greeks were very familiar with Tartarus, because Tartarus is the location where the Olympians, after they overthrew the Titans, imprisoned the gods, the Titans. It's the prison of the gods. Now, biblically speaking, we would say it's the prison of the Watchers. It's a very scary, very bad place. That's why I chose that translation, because it actually t it puts the, the, the actual word there, Tartarus, instead of hell. H and hell is essentially, the underworld is, is divided into three compartments. They had the upper level, the Greeks called paradise, or that the Bible calls the Abraham's bosom, the good area where, the, where Lazarus was. And then there's the area where the rich man was in the, in the story uh, that's more, more like what we would consider hell, a place of, of torment. But then Tartarus is the lower level even below that. A uh, very, very, very bad place. People were familiar with that when, when Peter wrote this. Uh, and in Jude, a very similar scripture, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Again, how did these two guys know that? Because it's not in your 66 books of canon. They had to have got it from someplace else. Uh, and the book of Revelation, something really interesting there too, is where John makes reference to the four angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. What's that all about? Now, the, the ancient texts say that they are buried in the sands of the earth. And something that's very, very interesting that uh, we should probably be aware of is the uh, book of Enoch talks about the um, angels were to be buried, the, the watchers, the fallen angels, were to be buried for 70 generations. And if I remember, I think Psalm 90, verse 10, defines a generation as 70 years. So if you take 70 generation times 70 years, you end up with 4,900 years, and you back up 4,900 years from today, you end up right on that chart that I showed you. Whoa. We are at the end. Of, yeah, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Seriously, we are, we are approaching the day 
when they are going to be released. And I believe if you look at the book of Revelation and the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments in particular, I believe that's what you're seeing is the release of Nephilim. On my blog series, I created a um, timeline. I believe it's probably the first of its kind. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, but I created an end times. Everybody's seen uh, time charts of the seven-year tribulation period. You know, Tim LaHaye, a lot of other people. Everybody's got a time chart for the end of the world. But uh, I have never seen one that incorporates the Nephilim. And, and I, it changes things significantly when you do incorporate that. So you can check that out through our materials there. Uh, and if you go to seedtheseries.com forward slash blog, uh, there's, a, there's a link called the seven-year tribulation period, and there's a timeline chart that I created there that incorporates the Nephilim and the release of them. Now, in the book of Enoch, it's, it's really interesting because there's a severe judgment uh, imposed on them. And uh, how many of you would like to see your children massacred? Anybody? No, nobody. Of course not. Well, the first thing that the fallen angels had to do was watch their first generation offspring kill each other off. They were, they were assigned 500 years and no more, and within that time, they were to kill each other off. So they were forced to watch their own children murder each other. And then God imposed a severe judgment and bound them in chains and put them in Tartarus and all that. And so they essentially hired Enoch to more or less be their attorney uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, present their petition to God. And so God said, okay, I'll play your little game. I'll work with, uh, with this whole attorney thing. Okay, here, here you go, Enoch. Uh, this is what you're going to tell them. No, I do not accept your, your petition. I do not forgive you. You will never have peace. It's a pretty severe judgment that, that God gave the watchers uh, through e the words of Enoch. And it says there, then I went and spoke to them all together, and they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them. These guys were terrified by the judgment that was about to be imposed upon them. So I, I ask you, if you're like in the military, let's say, and a platoon of your buddies uh, is assigned to a task, and the task goes really bad, and the judgment for doing so is horrible, and you are watching this, how likely are you going to, be to uh, volunteer for that same duty? Are you going to volunteer? You just saw all your buddies, what they did went horribly bad, and the judgment that they received was horrible. So are you going to volunteer to do the same thing? No. So can you imagine any of the other? Okay, Lucifer's already outnumbered two to one, right? So do you think he wants to risk any more of his people either? He's, if, that's the, if that's the sentence for doing what they, what they did, every time they did that, they would lose more people. So A, I don't believe anybody's going to volunteer for it, and B, I don't believe Lucifer would take the chance of risking more people. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, and regarding the terror, it, there's evidence of that also in the scriptures where Jesus comes across the, the maniac of Gadara. They had the, the legion, right? And he asked them what their name is. And they said, you know, legion because we're many. And it says, and they begged Jesus repeatedly, do not send us into a, the abyss. Please do not send us into the abyss. Shows the demons were painfully aware of the horrors of the abyss as well. They, Put us in the pigs anywhere, please. Just don't send us into the abyss. Again, this, the judgment was extremely... Severe. Now, uh, th this is from the movie Clash of the Titans that just recently came out. The, um, the pre-flood giants were, were absolutely huge. The book of Enoch says, that, and they bear great giants whose height was 3,000 L's. I've read many scholars that translate the 3,000 L's to be 300 cubits, which is 450 feet. Interesting number because that's the same number as the length of the ark, 300 cubits. But if you can imagine a 450 footer, <laughs> that's pretty huge. Now, we have trouble imagining that, but the Greeks didn't have a, any problem imagining that. They called them the Titans. The Titans. So the, the pre-flood giants were extremely huge. The post-flood giants, if you think of them in Greek mythology terms, you would have the Titans versus the Olympians. The first generation Nephilim were three to four times larger than the tallest of the post-flood giants. So something clearly happened that for them to be s that much smaller. And we have evidence of the post-flood giants and some of the heights. And we, we've seen this chart if you came to my talk yesterday. Uh, you got the average six-footer guy right there. And then you got, uh, just for sake of scale, you got what I call the Goliath scale, which scholars would place anywhere from 9 to 12 feet, uh, depending on who you read. Then you have the Og of Bashan scale, roughly 15 to 18 feet tall. Then you got the Canaanite giants there. And, and Amos 2.9 talks about the Amorites being as tall as cedar trees. 
Now, I, I, if you heard me yesterday, I don't believe God's in the habit of telling tall tales and exaggerating. I think he said, you know, there's a guy standing next to a cedar tree, and they're about the same height. See, they're, uh, the Amorites as tall as cedar trees. Cedar trees start at 35 feet and go up to 150 feet, the cedars of Lebanon. So they were huge, but they were not as big as the pre-flood giants. Post-flood giants may be the max about 150 feet compared to 450 feet. So that's the second reason why I don't believe that there was a second incursion, because when you mate angels with humans, you get the 450 footers, foot, footers there directly, at least according to the text. Third reason, as we saw in the chart, the Nephilim were on the earth for 1,000 to 1,200 years. And in that time period, they were, com they, they were able to completely corrupt and destroy God's creation. So if they're able to do that same thing, and that was pretty effective, right? You'd have to admit that, you know, 200 watchers corrupting God's entire creation in a thousand years is a pretty effective campaign. Well, they've had nearly five times that amount of time to do the same thing. If all they had to do is what they did in Genesis 6, why are we still here? They should have destroyed the earth five times over. Fourth reason is the text itself in the canon of Scripture. Uh, when the spies went into the land and they brought back the report, they said, you know, we look like grasshoppers compared to those guys. It says that the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. Where do they come from? Nephilim. It didn't say those giants were coming from angels mating with humans. It said the Nephilim were of the Nephilim. These are offspring of Nephilim. So it appears to be a genetic issue there. We saw the Nephilim, ha Nephilim there. The Anakites are from the Nephilim. This phrase, from the Nephilim, is min ha Nephilim. You'll notice there's no yod here. You have the same word spelled two different ways. I think the reason why this is done here is because this is the way it's spelled in Genesis 6. The writer wants to link these Nephilim after the flood with the ones before the flood. And if that's the case, if the Anakim came from, in other words, were related to the Nephilim from before the flood, you don't need the continual cohabitation. You have a genetic relationship intact, so to speak. And then, of course, in Amos, uh, it's talking about the Amorites, and we know that the Amorites were children of Canaan. Okay, so based on the testimony of Moses and Amos and the striking lack of any mention of angels in association with all post-flood accounts of giants, I believe that the Nephilim seeds continued via genetics, not copulation. What does that mean? As I was looking at the lineage of the sons of Noah, uh, and if you saw my talk yesterday, you know, you know where I'm going with this. The, the children of Ham, especially in the lineage of Canaan, were, were giants. Those were the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, all the ites that, the, that Joshua and his boys had to take out, and later David and, and his boys had to take out. They were sons of Canaan. Now, Mitzrayim also... Uh, Egypt, Mitzrayim, had a son named Kaftor who settled Crete. Crete is where all of Greek mythology originates from, so you got giants coming out of him. Nimrod, I believe, was also a giant, and that's Cush. So that's three out of four children that Ham had that all had giants. And so if angels aren't doing it, what, what do we have left? If no one is wife or pure, that means that his three sons were pure. So Ham was pure, just as pure as Shem and Japheth was. The only thing that makes any sense to me is that the wife of, of, of um, Ham probably had corrupt seed in her own genetics that perpetuated after the flood. And the same may be true with uh, Japheth's wife. If you look into Gog and Magog, they were also giants. So uh, I believe that it passed through that way. Now, people would say, that's absurd, Rob. Why would God allow Nephilim seed onto the ark? So the idea of, of one of the wives being contaminated in some way, with all due respect, I can't go there. So God wipes out the whole planet, but he misses Ham's wife? Huh? Just doesn't work for me. Second incursion. I just throw the question right back at him. Your, your, your suggestion of a second incursion is even more absurd, because if God had to destroy the entire planet because it had been completely destroyed because angels mated with women, why would God allow them to do that again? So I think it makes more sense that he would allow genetic seed what, whatever dormant Nephilim genes <laughs> uh, to pass through is a lot less absurd than the, than the opposite uh, situation there. But ultimately, why does God do anything? He does it to get the glory, right? Yeah. Now, he got the glory for the flood, but in the post-flood world, he got the glory through 80-year-old guys and little shepherd boys, right? He, th little shepherd boys. He got the glory through his people. 
And finally, regarding this whole issue, which is going to take us into the Roswell scenario, if all the angels had to do was have sex, then what's the deal with all this genetic experimentation and alien greys? Wh why all that? That's a whole lot of trouble, you know, scientific experiment, extraction of seed and implanting of embryos and all of that nonsense. If all they had to do was have sex, what's the deal with this? My belief that is that the greys are actually biological suits that, they've, that the demons have created for themselves. They are disembodied spirits that are always looking for a body. But a funny thing happened when Jesus showed up is they started getting casted out of bodies. <laughs> and then Jesus replicated himself and his followers, and his followers went around casting out demons too. So that becomes a bit of a problem, doesn't it? You know, you possess somebody and the Christian shows up and casts you out. So I believe that they decided, you know what, we're going to create our own bodies. And so you got all sorts of genetic material being extracted from humans as well as animals. I believe these are biological suits that they've created to do tangible uh, work on this earth. What are they doing? Uh, well, there's this short video I put together by Dr. David Jacobs. Have any of you heard of Dr. David Jacobs? He's interviewed a lot of people who have claimed to have alien abduction experience, experiences, uh, and this is what he has to say based on uh, his years of research. never been a phenomenon like this. This is completely unprecedented. Everything that happens on board is for a reason. Everything is logical, everything is rational, and everything is understandable with enough information. This was not a learning experience, and it wasn't an experiment. They were trying to figure out what makes us tick. The evidence suggested that this was a program. There is a reason for this program to be put in place. That's what the evidence clearly points to. What was happening was that people were talking about this reproductive material. People were having sperm taken. They were having eggs taken. People report that they were having embryos injected into them and uh, sometimes retrieved from them. Conclude is that maybe these people are creating hybrids, creating a, a special race of people with DNA from us, human DNA, and with the alien DNA, creating people that are, I guess, more intelligent, more sophisticated. And I have heard uh, other people tell me stories alluding to that effect. I began to hear accounts of abductees who were taken into a room and their attention would be directed to a screen-like device. And on the screen, there would be a scene of normal human activity. A picnic, kids playing ball, guys standing around a grill, people talking to each other. And they'll hear in their mind, can you tell the difference between you and us? And the person will look at the screen and say, huh? Uh, no, everybody looks the same to me. You know? And they'll say, see, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Soon we will all be together. Soon it will be wonderful. Soon everybody will be happy. Now, you hear that once, it's not a pattern. You hear that once, you just discard it. Interesting, who knows? But when you begin to hear it over and over again, then suddenly it has different meaning. This is from other people who are not aware of this testimony. And then I began to understand that what they were telling these abductees, what these beings were telling these abductees, is that ultimately this is an integration program into the society, not with gray aliens most likely, but with these hybrids who look quite human. For years and years and years, people would write to me and say, oh, well, are adult hybrids walking among us? And the answer is, absolutely not. There's no evidence whatsoever that that's the case. But the evidence that I've been getting recently in terms of the goals of the program is that 
That might be the case. I don't really know yet. It's possible. And I, I am embarrassed even to say that. I'm embarrassed. And yet, it fits the pattern of all the evidence that I've been hearing for the past 20 years. It's focused on hybrids. The reproduction is to reproduce hybrids. And it does appear to be an integration program as crazy as that may sound. Puts the whole scripture as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man into a little bit more focus, doesn't it? I don't believe we're going to see 50-footers, 100-footers walking around. I think that they're working r really hard right now to create people that look just like you and me uh, that will be Nephilim. What's interesting about that is if you look in the scripture uh, in Revelation with regard to those who follow the beast, um, and if you, if you look at the scripture, it says, you know, if we don't receive Christ as our Savior, our name is blotted out of the book of life. Everybody familiar with that? Well, you can't blot something out unless it was there to begin with. It had to be there to be blotted out. And I think that that supports the idea where God says he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The proof is he put your name in the book from the foundation of the world. You just got to confirm your reservation. You know, oh, sorry, you don't want to, you, you didn't want to accept my gift. I got to blot you out. I'm sorry, I never knew you. But it talks about those who follow the beast. It says those whose names were not found written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Well, who are those people? If our names are all written in the book of life to begin with, and all we got to do is confirm our reservation or get blotted out, who are these people whose name was never written in the first place? I believe we're talking about these people here that were never meant to exist in the first place. And I think those are the ones that are going to be following the beast. Those are the ones that we're going to be up against, you know, in the future. Now, I, I say that, and people, well, what about the rapture? I've written a 50-page uh, blog on, on the rapture. I, I grew up in a, in, a, in a fundamental Baptist background, and so I was taught pre-tribulation rapture my entire life and believed it my entire life. I've moved kind of all over the map in the last few years as I've studied it. Uh, I'm kind of like my dad now. He says, I, I'm pan trib <laughs> In the end, it's all going to pan out. <laughs> um, um, I don't know if it's pre, mid, or post. It, it may be all three. Uh, but um, the way I look at it, if it's a pre-tribulation rapture, whoo-hoo! Yeah! We're out of here. We don't have to worry about it. But the problem I have with most pre-tribulation uh, rapture viewpoints is that it creates a, an attitude of apathy. I don't know how many Christians that I know that have the attitude, good thing I don't have to worry about that. And I say, yeah, but what, what if we do? I'm just saying. I, I would rather be prepared in the event that we're not zapping out of here in advance. We may have to face some of these things and take a stand. I mean, it talks about overcomers a lot in the book of Revelation. Well, how can you be an overcomer if you don't have anything to overcome? So I, I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to go ahead and prepare myself in case I'm going to be here for a little while. Uh, and if we zap out of here first, great, wonderful. Uh, but I'm not going to be apathetic about the whole thing. Steve Quayle, he would take his mother out to eat every now and then. She has since passed away. <coughs> and when he'd take her out to eat, she would point at someone and say, that person's not real. Oh, yeah, I've heard him talk about that. And Steve would say... Uh, you know, just pass it off. But later on, when he did more studies, he's realizing what you have just said, right. that those could be the hybrids. Yeah, and, and I believe as we pray for discernment, the Holy Spirit leads us to all truth, right? Yeah. Let's start praying. Let's hold our questions just for, for a few. I want to try to get through this, but I, I appreciate the input. Um, we're going to need to start praying for discernment. Yeah. Yeah. What did I start to talk off with? We need to know our enemy, Right that masquerades as an angel of light or as a normal human being, <laughs> let's say. Of course, all of this talk is leading us to Roswell, New Mexico. Now, that's not where the actual site was where the, the sh supposed ship crashed. It was actually further, I believe, northwest, if I remember right. Uh, Roswell became famous because that's where everybody went and reported it. Uh, but again, David Flynn and a team of researchers went out there, I believe it was in 2005, with GPSs and, and some other equipment and stuff, and started taking measurements and doing some research out there. And wouldn't you know it, they determined that the location where the supposed Roswell crash was, uh, was on the 33rd parallel. And when they multiply it by the universal constant of pi, it gave them the longitude 104. What are the chances? 
As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. As it was on Mount Hermon, so I believe it was in Roswell, New Mexico. I don't believe these people are from, or these aliens are from Octurus or Aldebaran or Orion or the Pleiades or any of that. I believe it's repackaged Genesis 6 activity for another generation, for our generation. And in recent years, especially, I mean, we've had a steady diet, as some other speakers have talked about, of UFOs. You know, the, the War of the Worlds kind of, it was a test, I believe, and people flipped out. So they said, okay, let's, let's kick on the propaganda machine and start pumping out movies about flying saucers and aliens to desensitize people, get people used to it. And that's what we've had all through the 50s, 60s, and today, I mean, TV shows, movies. How many shows have you seen in movies regarding aliens? We're all, people are expecting it now. People are looking for it. The UN I I appointed an ambassador to aliens. And the Vatican says, yeah, when they show up, we'll baptize them. So <laughs> people are taking this a lot more serious uh, these days than they had in the past. Uh, but I put together a little montage of UFO sightings just in the last couple of years, uh, as reported by mainstream media. Uh, take a look at this. A scientist left baffled by an unexplained circular light seen hovering high over Moscow on Wednesday evening. People described it seeing a wide circular formation in the sky. Scientists from all over the world are trying to figure out what caused a mysterious blue light to spiral in the sky over Norway on Wednesday. As UFO sightings go, this one was as good or as weird as it gets. Early yesterday morning, just before dawn, this appeared in the Norwegian sky. A blue light, small at first, growing into a spiral and then disappearing into what appeared to be a black hole. Thousands of Norwegians bombarded the Meteorological Institute to ask what that light could have possibly been. Some feared it could have been a meteor, others a black hole, and there are even those that thought it could be aliens. A strange spiraling white light was spotted in the early morning sky over Sydney with even skeptical witnesses wondering if it was a UFO. The unusual sight was recorded by hundreds of people from Victoria north to Queensland. A spiral in the sky around a bright light. A UFO in China's skies forced Zhaoshan Airport to stop operations on July 7th. Outbound flights were grounded after the unidentified flying object was detected by a flight crew. For now, the UFO continues to be a mystery. Some Chinese residents are on edge this morning after another apparent UFO sighting. It's the second one in two weeks. The first sighting was on July 7th, and an airport had to be shut down. All right, that's a UFO if I've ever seen one. Yeah, can you that's identify undeniable. it? It's The airport had to be shut down after people apparently saw twinkling lights above the airport terminal. 17 flights had to be diverted. The, last, the latest sighting happened just two days ago, and people say they saw four lantern-like objects forming a diamond shape in the air, hovering in the sky for over an hour. And right. aviation experts say they don't know what it was. Strange and mysterious lights hovering above East El Paso tonight. What's even more strange, very similar lights were spotted in Manhattan just two days ago. Above the skies of Northeast and East El Paso tonight, a sight that was a little more than stunning. This is what one of our photographers, Ram Moreno, caught on video. One solitary light that appears to be falling in the sky. But that light suddenly breaks apart into two, then three separate lights. Those lights then just freeze in the air and begin to hover. Eventually, a fourth light can be seen. Then the lights appear to be hovering and then moving in a strange pattern. Then they all disappear. Just two days ago, in the sky above Manhattan, people froze on the street there as they saw these three lights hovering in the middle of the day. And check this out. The three lights are close to each other, then spread out into this triangle pattern. Now, look at the pattern side by side. This from Manhattan and the other tonight in El Paso. I gotta tell you, they do look eerily similar. A lot of people are looking up. It's because of a mystery in the sky. Is it a balloon, a UFO? Well, whatever it is, it sure has a lot of people talking. I would assume reporter Jeff Begase is live in Chelsea where crowds have gathered. Jeff, what's this all about? Well, Sade, we don't know.
Keiichi Okaku is a theoretical physics professor, and back on the screen, what is it? We don't know. We are stumped. Uh, scientists around the world are saying, what the heck is this object? There were giants in the earth in those days. But also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, what is that? the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Oh my gosh. Disclosure is very close, and the American people need to prepare themselves very soon for an announcement from our government that there is in fact extraterrestrial presence engaging this planet and a human race. When I look at some of these videos and stuff and look at this research, it can be really um, hard sometimes not to get afraid. Uh, you know, that stuff in Kazakhstan, I just put a few, that, that whatever it was in Kazakhstan there, that last one, really wild. And apparently Kazakhstan, I've been to Kazakhstan twice actually, and the, the scene, one of the scenes before that showed the news reporter and that thing hovering over the, the city there. Um, that was in Amati. Kazakhstan. I, I've been to missionary conferences in Almaty, Kazakhstan, right where that was, that shot was taken. All right. So apparently, Kazakhstan, whatever's going on over there, it's a new UFO hotspot. But the scriptures say the devil ramps up his activity in the last days because he knows his days are short. Daniel says that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. It's actually the knowledge. There's the hey. The hey represents the word the. It's the knowledge. I believe all this stuff we're talking about here is a part of the knowledge so we can understand the days that we live in so that we don't fall prey to the coming great deception that Yeshua warned us about. On the 13th of December, 1973, French journalist Claude Vaurion was driving through the volcanic area of Clermont-Ferrand, central France, when suddenly he noticed the bright flashing light in the sky heading in his direction. 
and as it got closer, he saw that it was made of a grey metallic substance, the shape of a flattened bell. Claude was invited into the craft, and over the next six consecutive days, the extraterrestrial dictated a series of messages, which are both clear and revolutionary. This is what the extraterrestrial said. We created humanity. You mistook us for gods. We were the ones who started all the religions on Earth. And now that humanity is capable of understanding this, we would like you to build an embassy where we can land officially in front of everyone. A long time ago on our planet, we had reached a stage similar to the one you are in now. Our scientists were beginning to design life through the synthesis of DNA. The whole of our society watched with fascination as they created more and more sophisticated organisms, daring each time to make an even more beautiful and sophisticated model of living art. Many ancient texts point to the work of these scientific creators. Let's open the Bible at the book of Genesis. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1.26 At the time, the human beings called these extraterrestrials Elohim, which in ancient Hebrew meant those who come from the sky. It's found in the original Bibles, but in more recent times was mistranslated by the word God. It's important to realize that this is a plural, the singular being Eloha. References to the Elohim can also be found in other ancient texts. For example, in the writings of the Hindu, Greek, Egyptian, and Amerindian civilizations. We can read even today about the many gods who had human emotions and who lived near or with these human beings. These gods talked to human beings and even had relations with them. I'm not afraid of this stuff. I'm not. Actually, my heart breaks because I know how many people out there aren't going to have a clue. I mean, seriously, what's going to happen when these guys finally do pop out and said, hi, we're the, An we're the Anunnaki, we are your creator. Remember the Nazca lines in Peru? Remember the, all the cuneiform tablets in Sumeria? And they point to all of these ancient artifacts as proof that they are our creators. That's what they say. The ancient texts say that the Anunnaki created us, not God. They, that they tinkered with genetic material from primates and turned them into homo sapiens. That's what the ancient texts say. So what happens when these guys park over our cities with major, you know, mile-wide ships and make that claim? What's it going to do to the average Christian's faith? I'm afraid for the people outside. Exactly. Yeah. I'm serious. <laughs> guys, we got to take this serious. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so is it going to be the coming of the Son of Man. Fallen angel activity is going to increase. Okay? My friend L.A. Marzulli is fond of saying, UFOs are real, burgeoning, and not going away. But I like something else he says. He says, rebuke first and ask questions later. Because <laughs> greater is he that is in us. Can't touch this. <laughs> We have a number of scriptures that should encourage us, that tell us to fear not. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Notice it says power. We're going to have to understand the power that lies within us and get to know how to use it so that we can rebuke first and ask questions later. These things have I spoken to you that... In me, you may have peace and not be freaking out when you start seeing this stuff. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's why we can say, for you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, whoever them may be. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Yesterday, I talked about the name Yeshua. I do believe there is power in the name of Jesus. I accepted Christ under the name of Jesus, and I've led many people to Christ in the name of Jesus in the foreign mission field, both, both foreign and domestic. I've uh, been in ministry, uh, in and out of ministry most of my life. But I believe there's an enormous amount of power in the name of Yeshua as well.
which is his given name. That's his Hebrew name. And my wife and I have been taking Hebrew classes, and uh, it's really interesting. There's a Hebrew idiom that says every letter has seven meanings. Every Hebrew letter has seven meanings. Therefore, every word has 70. And so they say that uh, the words have meaning, not only the meaning of the word itself, but the combined meaning of the letters that comprise the word. So it's a very complicated, very interesting in, in, uh, uh, language. But what I love about breaking down the letters of Yeshua Yod, Shin, Vav, Ein, is right to left, reading right to left as the Hebrews do. The name Yeshua translates to the hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. Okay? That's what Yeshua's name means. The hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. If you saw my talk yesterday, you know what the eye is in reference to, right? Antichrist, Nimrod, Osiris, the back of your dollar bill. 33.33, what, what, what did Jesus say? He came to destroy the works of the devil. I think it's so cool because he did it in every way, even his name and, and, and the, he was, what, 33, right? He died at 33 after a three-year ministry and was dead for three days. 33.33. <laughs> Here's what's really cool. There's a passage of scripture where Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi and he asks the question, who do you say that I am? I never understood that scripture because, you know, Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, and Jesus gets real excited about it, doesn't he? If you read that passage, and I never said, why is he getting so excited about that when from the day he was born, people told him he was the son of God, and the angels singing it, you know, uh, when he, he, uh, he's, uh, he picks Nathaniel to be a, a disciple, Nathaniel declares that he's the son of God, and he says, why, because I saw you under the fig tree? Well, <laughs> you're going to see greater things than that. Every time the demon-possessed people saw him, they, they cried out and said, You are the Christ. He said, Be quiet. So his whole life, people told him he was the Son of God. So why, at the end of his ministry, when Peter says it, why does he get so excited? I could never understand that till I stood in the location where that conversation took place in 2005. This is where Yeshua stood when he asked the question, Who do men say that I am? He stood at the base of Mount Hermon right there, in Caesarea Philippi, where there was an altar to the Greek god Pan, who was the god of shepherds. So I think it's awfully poetic that the good shepherds stood in front of the Greek god of shepherds and asked the question. Then, uh, actually, if you're standing there looking at the altar of Pan, which was very much kind of like Petra, you know, like a city in the, in the rock. It wasn't quite that big, but uh, it was embedded in the rock. Just off to the right is a foothill, and at the top of the foothill is a place called the fortress of Nimrod, who was the first antichrist who tried to create a one world system without God, in fact, tried to kill God. So as he's looking at Pan in front of him, off to the right is the fortress of Nimrod. Off to the left is a location that even still to this day, but at the time was, still, was known as the Gates of Hades, a physical location. So when he says the Gates of Hades will not prevail, he was standing right in front of the Gates of Hades, which I've maintained is not just a place. Hades is the brother of Zeus. It's, a, it's an entity as well. And then something really interesting happens. It says he, six days later that Yeshua took Peter, James, and John to the top of a high mountain. Well, Mount Hermon is by far the, t the tallest mountain in the region, and they're in the area anyway. So many scholars believe, as I do, that he took them to the top of Mount Hermon for the Mountain of Transfiguration, where today there is a UN radar outpost. Huh. I understand the strategic location with Syria and Lebanon and all that, but it's kind of interesting that there is right across from a cross where people believe is the spot of the Mountain of Transfiguration took place, that the UN of today, just like Yeshua of his day, could look down from that spot to the very location where the watchers landed. Brought them. Yeah. How did he brought them? Did he uh, don't know, but they ended up there very strategic location to bring them right to the spot where, where the, the plan was hatched that tried to prevent him from existing in the first place. Genesis chapter 6, right? The devil wants to destroy the seed of Eve so that the seed of Eve can't crush his head. Well, the seed of Eve was standing right there looking down, and basically I believe he was looking off and saying, okay, I got your number. Let's play. The best way I can explain this as an, as an allegory is the movie Rocky which I've come to realize is not a movie about boxing. It's, an, it's, it's actually a pretty extraordinary series, and there's a couple of them that are kind of goofy and all that, but uh, 
I don't know where St- Sylvester Stallone stands in his faith. He claims to be a Christian. He, he's, you know, he's made some questionable movies and stuff. But, but as a writer myself and, and filmmaker, I, th- there's something in him that he understands. Uh, let's just put it that way. Everything that's in a movie is, an inten- is very intentional. Nothing ends up on screen except that it has been well thought out in advance, planned out, and orchestrated. Okay, f- so the very first scene that you see in Rocky, when you fade from black, fade up from black, is a picture of Jesus. It's the first thing you see when, when the movie fades up from black, is a picture of Jesus. You, the camera pulls back a little bit farther, and there's Rocky fighting Spider Rico and two nobodies in the basement of a church. Notice what it says behind him, resurrection. Okay, so he's a nobody fighting a nobody. Then he gets this unbelievable chance of a lifetime to go up against the heavyweight champion of the world, right? What's his name? Apollo Creed. Now, if you heard my talk yesterday, you know who Apollo is, right? Apollo, son of Zeus, son of perdition, <laughs> Antichrist, Creed is the belief system of a people group. So Rocky, the rock, is going up against Apollo Creed, the heavyweight champion of the world. What does he do before the big fight? He goes and surveys the ring. So he walks into the ring that night before the big fight. There's a big giant banner of Apollo Creed. He goes home, and he has sort of his Garden of Gethsemane moment of doubt. Sits with Adrian, not sure if he can go through with this whole plan. And then this, this quiet resolve comes over him, and he gets this, this new strength, and he just says, you know what? I don't care if I beat him. I just want to go 15 rounds. No one has ever gone the distance with Creed. That's all he cared. He wanted to go to the distance with Creed's. So next day, gets into the fight of his life takes the beating of his life from the heavyweight champion of the world round after round just being pummeled and and Apollo is given everything he has unleashing on Rocky but after 15 rounds Rocky was still standing the last scene in the movie is everybody's flipping out right you, you remember you you were just as excited as everybody in the movie right Woo-hoo! Everybody's excited, and the commentator's like, Rocky, what was going through your mind? Rocky, what were you thinking? And as he's saying that, Adrian, his bride-to-be, is coming into the, into the ring area, and Polly lets her in. And the last line in the movie is Adrian saying, I love you, and Rocky saying, I love you. Fade the black. I'm like, I've seen that story somewhere before. Pretty amazing. And then if you take it to Rocky too, Rocky, the rock, the second coming, First, he marries Adrian, he gets married, and then he goes back into the ring and he beats Apollo. Hmm, I'm like, I don't know if if Sylvester Stallone really gets it, but man, that's an amazing analogy for what I think is going on on Mount Hermon in Caesarea Philippi. Because Jesus, right before he's about to go 15 rounds with the devil, so to speak, went and surveyed the ring. He went, and from that location, he could look down to the Antichrist, to the fortress of Nimrod. He could look over to the location where the fallen angels landed to try to prevent him from existing in the first place. He could look down to the gates of Hades and the altar of Pan. He's like, okay, Nimrod, I got your number. Okay, watchers, you wait. You watch. (laughs) You're, You're in for something. Because it says from that point on that from that moment on, Jesus went from that location there for the Mount of the Transfiguration, preaching about his death, burial, and resurrection. And he headed directly to Jerusalem where he went 15 rounds with the devil and was still standing when it was over. And oh, by the way, it says that he went down first, right, after he died. And m- many of your translations probably say preached to those in prison. I think that's kind of a poor translation, the word Caruso. It's, it's heralded in victory. He went down to Tartarus and said, aha, you lose, I win, I'm taking the keys, I'll be back, and it's not going to be good for you. On his way up, he liberated the saints in Abraham's bosom. Pretty amazing thing that really makes the statement make a whole lot more sense now why Yeshua took them to Caesarea Philippi, of all places, to ask that pretty profound question. And Peter's answer, which is so amazing, because I can see Peter sitting there going, you know, the rabbi knows who we think he is. This must be a rhetorical question. You know, his buddies are going, you know, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah, whatever. And I see Peter just kind of going, what is he really asking? And as a filmmaker, this is the way I see the scene, is that that Yeshua has his back to to Pan, 
and, and Peter's looking at, at Yeshua, and it's called a rack focus. Yeshua goes out of focus, and Pan comes in focus. Pan goes out of focus, and Yeshua comes in focus, and he goes, oh, I get it. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Yeah, that's right, Peter. Blessed are you. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this, but my father just told you what we're doing here. My destination is Jerusalem. He took an awfully big detour to go all the way up to southern Lebanon to have this little conversation. Peter understood what was going on there. And he says that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of what or who? Hades will not prevail. And then he goes on to talk about some really interesting things about binding and loosing. I think we're going to have to understand this whole binding and loosing thing. I really do. And that's why we have created a TV series called Seed that we're working desperately to get on the air. Seed, you'll notice that uh, I've got these backward E's there. If you put the two E's together, it forms the first letter of the word God in Greek. Uh, Theos, I think it is. God is the center of seed. See, how do we get this message out to the masses? We've got to do it in a way that the masses can receive it. Paul says the carnal mind cannot discern the things of the spirit because they're spiritually discerned. So why in the world are all the Christians out there trying to make movies where every 10 minutes somebody's going, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. <laughs> right? How many of you have seen the Christian movie? It's usually the guy with the southern accent saying, the Bible says. <laughs> I grew up in Texas, so, okay? You know, I'm from Texas. I can say that. <laughs> The carnal mind cannot receive that. The carnal mind does not go see that. Okay? So you've got to put it in a package that they can receive. And Yeshua understood that too. He didn't walk around with scrolls under his arm saying, Obadiah says, uh, Nahum says. <laughs> no. He taught fishing and farming stories, right? Parables. The illustrated kingdom principles in a culturally relevant way. And so that's what we're trying to do is take all this information that you've been exposed to here at the future Congress and what you've heard me talk about and wrap it up in a package that the world can receive and l just lace seed with seeds. But then it's your job. There's, there's, I'm going to talk about the next talk I have later this afternoon about being culturally relevant. At the end of The Passion of the Christ, um, a lot of the evangelicals that got behind Mel Gibson, they, it is a powerful film, so they were trying to, to push Mel Gibson to put an invitation at the end of the film. You know, put a good altar call at the end of the, of the movie. And I appreciate what he said. He said, no, guys, that's not my job. That's your job. My job is to put compelling images up on the screen. Your job is to do the follow-up. And that's what I would submit to you all with seed as well. I'm going to put compelling images up on the screen. It's your job to do the follow-up. Get your friends to watch it. Talk about it so we can get this stuff out to the masses. There's, what, 700 people here at the Future Congress? There's 300 million people in the country. And we've all established that churches aren't talking about this stuff, so where are they going to get the information? Our stated mission statement for seed is to plant seeds that will enable people to understand the times that we're living in and to walk in the power of the kingdom that comes only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I spent five absolutely amazing days alone with the Lord in the desert of Arizona that was very Abraham Moses type experience is all I can say and out in the desert alone with God God basically plugged a USB cable in my head and downloaded 72 episodes of a TV series called seed now they're not all written but all 72 episodes are extensively outlined six seasons 12 episodes per season three scripts have already been written you can pray with us about this if you know anybody that can help us we cannot go through the major networks if we go to ABC NBC CBS Fox sci-fi they will censor our content they will cancel us prematurely. You know, they'll try to control everything. And if they cancel us, they own the rights. We can't do anything. We have to do this independent. And if we're going to do this successfully, we have to do it on par with everything else you've seen on TV. It's got to be able to compete with Fringe and V and The Event and all these other shows that are on TV. So if you believe in what we're trying to do and what our mission is, we invite you to participate, to come alongside us, to help us. If you know of a venue that we could come and give these presentations, let us know. You know, if you pay for our flight out there and our accommodations while we're there, we'll do the seminar for free. Just get us there, okay, and, and pay for us while we're there. Uh, we'll do the seminars for free. This is part of how we're getting people educated in the content, but also showing them about seed because I want to create a movement. You know, if I just raise three dollars and thirty-three cents from three hundred thousand people, there's my budget. That sounds like a lot of people until you realize the market for science fiction. 
numbers in the millions. All right. Now, if we get $33 subscribers, then we only need 30,000 people. <laughs> One way or another, I, I've asked the question, if we were out in the desert trying to spread the word of Christ and talk about all this stuff, would you pay for a bottle of water just to keep us going per day? Well, that's basically what we're asking for is a dollar a day. And uh, we treat this very much as a ministry because it is a ministry. Uh, so we ask for suggested donations. My wife will come up here and, uh, and help you with that if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, we're done. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you coming out. Sorry about that. My uh, my microphone was turned off. Let me turn that up here. All right, that concludes this presentation. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. That was the Mount Hermon Roswell connection. Uh, again, if you're interested in uh, that as a DVD, you know all of my content's out there for free. People. Uh, buy my books and DVDs to support what we're doing uh, and they do so because they want to not because it's their only option so all my books and DVDs and everything is based on the content like this that's coming out there for free but if you'd like to help us out uh, you can do so by going to babylonrisingbooks.com click on the store tab there's stuff there or on the seed website click on the store tab and uh, of course we've got the the books and everything related to seed merchandise cool shirts like the one I'm wearing right here through Teespring uh, um, I actually put all of my DVDs onto one DVD ROM as mp4 files so instead of getting six DVDs uh, you can get them all on one as mp4 so of course they won't play in a DVD player they will play on your computer uh, for a significantly reduced price uh, or you could get all the DVDs uh, you see here various uh, DVD ROM packs there as you see uh, all kinds of research package deals again this is all of the research the nonfiction foundation upon which the science fiction and the fantasy of, of seed is being built is, is in these materials here uh, which th these package deals you end up saving quite a bit if you're interested in checking that out so um, that's about all for tonight um, Tomorrow I will be doing restarting Virtual House Church. That starts at uh, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time here on my YouTube channel. 2 p.m. Central Standard Time restarting Virtual House Church. If you, uh, in fact, let me go there. That's uh, virtual. You can do some homework between now and then because uh, we're we're probably not going to play the um, the the audio for the reading. Uh, we're going to assume you have already d done the reading. If you go to virtualhousechurch.com, virtualhousechurch.com, scroll down in the main menu, we are starting the book of Numbers tomorrow, Numbers chapter 1. So that's uh, week number 34 in the main menu, Numbers week 34. So uh, if you click on that, they'll take you to this page right here. And the scripture readings are in the right-hand menu. If you click on that, that takes you to... Uh, the portion we'll be studying, Numbers chapter 1 through 4, you can read that in the King James, or if you prefer a different translation, you can select uh, whatever translation you like there. Um, and in the prophets, Hosea and Luke and 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. Uh, and what I would recommend you do, uh, in addition to that, um, or actually if you just click on one of these videos, the 2014 broadcast or the 2017 um at least in the 14, I don't know if they did it in the 17, but in the 2014, we actually have the audio of the scriptures being read to you um, from, uh, I think it was Bible.is, Bible I believe. Uh, so, yeah, this is your homework assignment. Click on that video there, watch it, and be ready to uh, discuss it. Um, I don't know that we'll be set up to do call-ins like I had done in the past, but uh, my friend Kevin Roberts, who was the facilitator of, of our home group fellowship here in the Dallas area um, before he moved. Uh, we were He was hosting it at his house. Anyway, uh, I contacted him, and he's like game for coming on, so this will be the first time introducing him to you guys, the guy that had a huge influence on me. I'll be bringing him on. And uh, Jake Grant from uh, Now You See TV will be joining us as well, at least uh, last I heard anyway. So uh, it'll be the three of us giving commentary on this particular week's portion. And um, I told Jake it'd be great if he can help me out in the chat room so you guys can ask us questions related to the 
to the Torah portion or in the prophets in the New Testament, anything related to this particular week's study, you can ask us questions uh, in the YouTube chat room here, and we'll try to address them on the broadcast. And then probably Sunday, um, I might see about releasing the, the, the next presentation that I did was why we need to be culturally relevant. Um, that content, a bit of, quite a bit of it is dated. So I, I, I think I actually did an update on that, uh, let me see, several years ago. <clears throat> um, I might just repost it. Uh, let me see if I go to the TV series. <clears throat> I think that that presentation was already loaded on my YouTube channel. And if you scroll down... Do, 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 do. Where to go? Why we need to be culturally relevant. That was the the last presentation that I gave at the Future Congress. Uh, the one you just heard was in the morning. I think it was a Sunday morning, and then uh, later in the afternoon, I did the Why we need to be culturally relevant talk. And um, I, I'll see if uh, it's worth reposting. Uh, if it is, keep an eye out. Probably do it sometime on Sunday. All right, so that's all we have for this evening. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow on Virtual House Church. Good night, everybody.